I want to speak to you today about God is good all of the time. All of the time, God is good. Amen. Some of you know that. Well done. One of the greatest events in Greek mythology is the event of the Trojan War. The Trojan War was a war between the Grecians and the Trojans. A war which lasted 10 years. And it all started because of the love of a beautiful woman. This woman's name was the Queen Helen of Sparta. And what happened was, so I'll go back there before I that. Queen Helen of Sparta was married and she fell in love with the Prince of Troy. His name was Paris. So one day while Paris was visiting Greece, he took Helen to come and abducted her. They lived together. They sneaked on a ship and went back to Troy. And then the next morning, who woke up by Queen Helen's husband? And boy, was he not happy with that plan. Eh? He woke up very, very upset. So he went to his brother, who just happened to be the king of Greece. He said, listen, the Trojans, they stole my wife, and we've got to go and get her. So that's just what happened. The king of Greece sent thousands of ships, thousands of ships across the Asian Sea. So there's Greece, we get the Asian Sea. He sent thousands of ships over to Troy. Troy was in the north. Uh, western side of Turkey there. And they besieged the city of Troy. And they said the, the battle went on for 10 years. Ongoing skirmishes and fights between them. No one really winning. They could not penetrate Troy. Troy was impenetrable. They had a big, thick wall. You could not break through it. So they just kept on fighting and fighting. Until one day, you know what happened? The Greeks left. They retreated. But at the gate of Troy, they left a gift. A horse, a huge wooden horse. So the Trojans thought, yeah, yeah, we won the victory, the Greeks have left us. And look, they even gave us a gift. Wow, isn't that awesome? So they opened up the gates and they let this big wooden horse inside and had a big celebration. That night, wow, they party like it was 1999. <laughs> yeah, Prince. They, they party like it was 1999 and, and because they thought they, they'd won the victory. But what happened is nightfall fell. That horse was hollow. And inside that hollow horse was the greatest of Grecian warriors, Archimedes, Odysseus, Ajax. They opened up the horse. They jumped out. They killed the gods at the gate. Opened up the gates of Troy and said, Come, my friends, Grecians, we can conquer the city. And they came in. They killed everyone, destroyed the city, and burnt it to the ground. And there, the great city of Troy, lie deep in myth and legend. Until 1870, when excavations were actually done in that same area where Homer said it was, these ancient writings. And lo and behold, they actually found the ancient ruins of the city of Troy. In the 1980s, they done more excavations and they got down the layer, layer, layer. And eventually they found the layer where they found charred debris and remains of skeletons which they said was evidence of a great battle, a great war. So there might be truth after all to that myth and legend, the great story of Homer, the Trojan War. It might be based, in fact, after all. Just like the city of Troy, there's a great city in the Bible, the city of Nineveh, which was also besieged and also destroyed. So we're going to read about that today. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to the book of Nahum in the Old Testament. If you don't know, contents. Contents, people, contents. We're going to read from the book of Nahum in the Old Testament, one of the last books of the Old Testament. I'll give you ten minutes to find it. <laughs> the Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble, He cares for those who trust in Him. But as an overwhelming flood, He will make an end of the He will pursue His fellows into darkness. Whatever they, whatever they plot against the Lord, He will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled in all thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed by dry stomach. From you on their own. As one comes forth who plots evil against the Lord and counsels with the Thank you. Yes, you. Again, I've got two questions for you. You know what the questions are. Who has read the book of Nahum? Put up your hands. If you've read the book of Nahum, Okay, that's the second question. Who has never ever heard of the book of Nahum? Put up your hand, don't lie in the church. No, <laughs> um, yeah, well, 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 that's good news, because I'm going to teach you something about the book of Nahum. 
I'm going to share it with you today. Today, God bless you because you can learn something about this great book. Tucked away in the Old Testament is the book of Nahum. Nahum was a man, the Bible only says simply that he was an Alkashite, which means he comes from the town of Alkosh. And people have said that Alkosh was a little town in Iraq, northern Iraq, between Masul, which is one of the prominent towns, and the Nineveh Plains. The Nineveh Plains, where you see there, is actually where the excavation was done and they found the ancient city of Nineveh. So Alkosh was somewhere between the two, about 30 miles from Masul. Okay, it was a, a little town, strange enough, incidentally, it's in the news today because we know that Iraq and Syria has been taken over by ISIS. Al Kosh is the only remaining Christian stronghold in Iran. There's about 500 Christians still living there, and ISIS has fortunately not got their hands on it yet. So we've got to pray for the thing that Al Kosh, and as I said, it was not only just a place for Christians now, but long ago it was a place where this man Nahum lived, the prophet. And right there we actually see the tomb of Nahum in the town of Al Kosh. So Nahum was a prophet of God, called to preach to the Jews and to the Ninevites. The name Nahum means comfort. And it's strange, if you read the book of Nahum, which is your homework for this week, by the way, so write Nahum down. <laughs> it's three beautiful chapters, it's one of the most poetic books in the Bible. It's a bit graphic though, because the last two chapters, only three chapters, two and three chapters is very graphic, all about the taking over and destruction of Nineveh. But very beautiful, one of the most beautiful poetic books in the Bible. His name means Nahum, his name means comfort. And it's strange because it's a book about judgment. But it's a twofold book. The small little book is a book about comfort for the Jews. Because the Jews will be persecuted and they'll be taken into exile into Syria by the Syrians. So it was Nahum, he had to give a message to the Jews and tell them, listen guys, you came to a terrible thing right now. You've been taken as far as a person can kill. I know it's bad, but God is still with us and he's going to bring us through us. And on the other side, the flip side, it was a message of judgment. Of the Ninevites. He didn't live far from them. Remember, the city was just a way off. He had to go to them and say, listen, God has given you a message and He said that you will be destroyed. Judgment is coming. And there's no turning back. It has been written, foretold, prophesied, and I'm here to tell you that your days are now numbered. So that was the book of Nahum. Nahum is a shortened version of Nehemiah. Have you heard of Nehemiah in the Bible? Nahum is a shortened version. It's still meaning comfort. Nehemiah means comforter. So here we have Nahum called to God. He lives in a still town, a still obscure town in Iraq. And his message is to the Jews taken in exile and to the Ninevites still living there about impending doom. And the interesting thing about the book of Nahum, it's a sequel book. You know what sequel means? It means the one that comes next, the one that comes after. Um, and it's very common in the Bible to have books of sequel because it's a progressive revelation. The Bible starts in Genesis. And then it ends by Abraham, Isaac, and then it goes to Moses, Exodus, and then it goes to Joshua, are you with me? And then the judges, and then the kings. So as you go through the Bible, it is sequential, and that's how God ordained it to be. So we can follow the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, a beautiful continuation of chronological order. This we find in the New Testament, clearly in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. So Luke wrote both, both of these books, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And they see tension because the book of Acts continues the story of the gospel of Luke. So in the Old Testament, we get lots of these books. Now Luke is a sequel book. Do you know to what book it's a sequel? The book of Jonah. Who has read the book of Jonah? I'm sure even the kids. Do you know about Jonah? Do you know Jonah? Does any king in this... Do you guys know about Jonah? <laughs> then I can know about Jonah. Don't worry, tell me that you about the book of Nahum. He said, Nahum, what do you say? Make sure you pronounce it right. <laughs> that was a book in the Bible, Tony. <laughs> you should know that. The book of Jonah, we know the story. So to understand the, the background to Nahum, we're going to quickly digress to Jonah. And for those who don't know about Jonah, we'll quickly relay the story. Jonah was a prophet of God, given the message to preach to the Ninevites. The same city we're talking about. And God felt sorry for him. He said, listen, Jonah, go preach to them and extend my grace. I'm telling them that uh, I will judge him. But if they repent, I'll save them. And Jonah, man, he was just like Donald Trump and the EFF. He was a racist of note. Have you heard the news about Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> he wants to get blacks from Norway. Good luck with that one. <laughs> There's no blacks in Norway, Donald Trump. <laughs> anyway, focus. Racist. Jonah was a racist. 
He didn't want to go preaching them because they were non-Jewish. First of all, he wouldn't go preaching non-Jewish people. And second of all, they were very, very evil and wicked and cruel and ruthless people. He wouldn't be seen near none of the preaching people. So you know what John had done? He got on a boat and went a thousand miles in the opposite direction of where God called him to go. <coughs> While he's in the Mediterranean Sea on his way to Spain, a great storm comes up. And the people on board know that it's Jonah's fault. And know what they do? As good friends would, they throw him overboard. They throw him overboard. There you lay, boom, in the Mediterranean Sea. And now he's busy drowning. And what happens next? Who knows what happens next? The whale of the big fish. <laughs> the whale comes in, boom, like they chomp at it. Remember they chomp at it? And he's gone. And then the whale takes him back and spits him out on dry ground. And there we go. He actually came all the way back where he started from. So now he's thinking, covering sea, we all wet. And God comes to him and says, Hey, buddy, where have you been? <laughs> Listen, I'm going to give you a second chance. Do you want to go preach to the people of Nineveh? And there he goes, thinking with seaweed. Very reluctantly, I might say, he goes to the Ninevites. And he preaches to them. And he preaches to them the best sermon you will ever hear in your life. The most powerful sermon in the Bible. That's all of eight words long. I know you would like those sermons. Yeah. There's nothing to get there. <laughs> eight word of sermon. Basically, the sermon went like this. You have 40 days to repent or die. That was it. That's all he said. He wasn't interested in sweet talking to He wasn't going to give them this big, oh, God. He's, yeah, he said, listen, guys, you have 40 days. If you don't repent, you're dead. You said a reason. And that's it. That, that was his sermon finished. And to his surprise, you know what happened? All the people repented. Oh, man. <laughs> and you know, I felt dead. From the king down to the slaves. They all repented. And they said, all right, we're going to honor and worship the God of Israel when we repent of our sins and our cruel, ruthless ways. Obviously, he wasn't happy about this. The book of Jonah ends with Jonah sulking on the outskirts of the city. But anyway, a hundred years later, what happens? The town of Nineveh forgets about the God of Israel. They go back to their cruel, ruthless ways. Not only that, they go further and they go and persecute the people of God, the Jews. They go and conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. Take the ten tribes of Israel and they scatter them all over the Syrian Empire. And man, God does not like that. Hundred years later, what happens? The book of Nahum. He calls the prophet of Nahum and says, Nahum, I've given these guys a chance before. But now they've turned their back on me. Not only that, they're now persecuting my people. Tell them that judgment is on the way. They will not see the year now. That's exactly what happens. So Nahum has this very message. And he actually calls it in Nahum, he calls it a burden, a heavy message. Because he, he, you know, he likes his people, he lives for them. And he doesn't want to tell them that God's going to destroy them. But that's a message that God gave him. But in amidst all this turmoil, he has a message of hope and comfort for the people of Israel. Let's quickly read that. Nahum 1 3 says, The Lord is slow to get angry. He's a lot of patience, but eventually it runs out. But his power is great. Oh, what a beautiful verse. And he never lets a guilty go unpunished. He displays his power in the world and in the storm. The blowing clouds of the dust beneath his feet. Just by that you can see how beautiful it's written. Compared to Jeremiah, wow, what a difference. Jeremiah is a very depressing book. Very long. This one. And the interesting part there is he displays his power in the world and in the storm. Sometimes we feel like we're in a storm, isn't it? When we go through things, not physical storms, but sometimes we go through relationship issues. And, and even when we get to the point where we're looking at divorce, sometimes we go through storms of illnesses. We go to the doctor and we come back and all of a sudden we have heart failure of some people. Where's my heart failure? There we go, Eugene. <laughs> we, all of a sudden we, we land up in hospital and ICU and we don't know what's going on. Sometimes it's financial difficulties. We all go through things. I don't think there's anyone in this church that hasn't gone through things. Even now at the start of the new year, we might think, oh, I'm glad that we started from afresh. You know what? Many of us here have carried the same problems and burdens we have carried from 2017. We all go through things. The comfort no one gives is, listen, God is with you in that storm. He's not only going to be with you, He's the God of the storm. This is what the psalmist said. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders. Somebody write that down. The God of glory thunders. It's one of the most awesome words I've ever seen. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. Maybe you've heard the phrase, God works in mysterious ways. Who knows where that is in the Bible? Who knows what book or chapter that is? Does anybody know where that is in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Did you know that? 
is actually the one that comes from a poem written by William, William Cowper back in the late 1700s. He wrote this poem, and in it it goes like this. The actual words of God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. He sets his footsteps in the sea. And he rides upon the storm. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, the God of glory thunders, man. You see, when we go through things, we look around and say, God, where are you? But you know what the truth is? God is with you in the storm. And he's promised to give you the joy and the comfort and the peace. And he's promised to get you out of that storm. That was his message to the people of Israel. He said, you're going to a bad time now, but it's not going to last forever. Judgment will come to those who punish you, and I will bless and prosper you still. In the storm. There's a story of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a great British preacher. One day he was walk, walking in the fields in the English countryside with a friend who was a farmer. And they, he saw a barn, and on the barn he had a weather vane. You know what a weather vane is? It's normally got north, south, east, and west. And it had a sign on the weather vane that said, God is love. And Charles Spurgeon said to his friend, he said, I think that's a bit inappropriate because, you know, uh, the weather vane is always moving around, it's variable, but God's love is constant. Then his farmer friend said to him, oh, Mr. Spurgeon, you got it all wrong. You missed out the simple truth. The truth is this, no matter what way the wind blows, God is love. Isn't that beautiful? In your life, no matter what way the wind is blowing, no matter what hell rises against you, no matter what storms are battling you today in your life, no matter how bad the winds are pushing you where you don't want to be, let me tell you, God is love. He loves you. And He has no intent of hurting you or destroying you or killing you. He is there with you. Our job is not to say, why God? Our God is to say, God, in the storm, I trust you. I love you and I know that you've got a plan for my life. Job in the Bible, he went to hell. He lost his family, his business, all his houses, all his cattle, all his giraffes, all his everything. And even after that, he says, Though you slay me, still will I trust you. Man, if only I could have bold faith like that. Even if you kill me, Lord, I don't care what I go through, even if you kick me in the groin right here, I will still love you and I will still trust you. That is bold faith. That is now his message to Israel. God is love no matter what. Nahum goes on to say this. Nahum 1 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. What is the message title? God is good. All of it. The psalmist said it like this. The Lord is good to all. To all. He has no intent of killing people, even the Amalekites. He said, listen, I'll, I'll save you and I'll make you a great city if you just repent and follow and honor me. That was it. The God is good to all his tender mercies of all, all of his works. You see, God is good all of the time. You know, we have a very different mindset of how God works as Christians. You know that? We think that when we good and when we have good things happen to us, God is good. And when we have bad things happen to us, whoa, God is bad. bad. God is punishing us. He's judging us. Ah, wow, what a very faulty, immature look at how God works at things. Let me explain to you how it works. When you go through good things, God is good. And when you go through bad things, God is good. That's one of his characters that cannot change. God's goodness is one of these things that he has that cannot change no matter how you feel today, no matter what you're going through, no matter what things are coming against you. That does not change the fact that God is good. Always. All the time. I know we said it when I opened the message. God is good all the time. We say it almost like it's just a song. But it's not. The truth in that is paramount and pivotal to your Christian experience. God is good no matter what. You can't turn around and say, God, why is this? Because just like Job, the whole book of Job is Job asking questions to God. And you know how it ends? With God asking questions to Job. His first question is this. I understand you're going through things, Job. And you question it and you doubt it and you wonder and all this stuff. You know what God's first question to him was? He says this, where were you when I made the universe? Did you make the universe? Did you make it, Tony? Did you make the moon? I know you made the moon. <laughs> Lopi, did you make those big souls? No, you didn't. Until you do any of those things, you can come back and talk to me about my sovereignty and the way I work in life. Our job is not to question God. Yes, we can have doubts and we can go to times of grief and mourning. And we can say, God, why? Why? But as soon as you say that, you're going to change around and say, God, I love you and I trust you. And I know that you're still on the throne. And I know that you're in control of everything. 
Because God works all things for the good for those that love Him. One of my power verses I used it before is Romans 8.28. Do you remember that verse? It says, God works all things together for those that love Him. God works all things together for the good for those that love Him. There's a story I heard about a little boy about this week. Yeah, let's use him as my example. How old is he? How old is he? How old is he? He's eight. We'll use eight. And your name is? What's your name on here? Aiden. 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 Aiden's eight years old and he goes to his grandma one day. And grandma is busy baking a cake. And he goes and hey, he's just complaining and complaining. He's a real Indian. <laughs> he complains and complains and he says, ah, you know, he's complaining about his friends and about his school and about his family. And his grandma's busy baking a cake. And she says to him, hey, Aiden, you want something to eat? He says, yeah, sure. And then she takes cooking oil and says, yeah, you have some cooking oil. And he says, oh, yeah, I don't want that. She says, you have some raw egg. You want a raw egg to eat? He says, no, Grandma, that's gross. She says, yeah, I've got some baking soda or some flour. He says, no, Grandma, all of those things are gross. They're all yucky. And his grandma says to him, yes, all of these things by themselves are not nice. But once you mix them together in the right order and at the right time, they make a beautiful, delicious cake like we're going to eat next door. Happy birthday to Bob. I nearly forgot Bob. <laughs> Happy birthday to Bob. That's what we're going to be eating all the delicious cake just <laughs> Bob, may the Lord richly bless you for, for, for all what you've done in this church and may he bless you further down the line for many more victories. Thank you. Um, digress back to the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that in church. Wow. A beautiful, delicious cake. And that's how God works with us. You see, we go through the illness. We go through the loss of life. We go through the job loss. We go through all these things. And when we look at them isolated, yeah, they are gross. And they're yucky. And they suck. We don't want these things. But God's not finished with us. God said, yes, all these things by themselves are not good. But I'm not finished yet. Because when all things work together, they will work out for the good. For you and me that love me. Isn't that beautiful? That's a promise we must stand on. No matter what we came to, no matter what storms or adverse, we've got to know that God is love. We've got to know that God is good all of the time. And that whatever's happening in our life, it's not over. It's not going to be forever. It's going to come to an end. Just like with the Israelites. Their punishment, persecution, was eventually going to come to an end. Now who goes on to prophesy the end of that great city of Nineveh. He says that it will be like a flood. And that's exactly what happened in 612 BC. The Babylonians aligned themselves with the Medes. And they started to conquer Syria from the north. They eventually besieged this great city of Nineveh. A three month siege. And just like Troy, they couldn't get in. These walls were impenetrable. They just couldn't get in. So they stayed and they waited out. And then something crazy happened. You can see God intervened. They started to rain. And it really started to rain very, very hard, so much that it caused a flood. And you know what happened? The Tigris River, which runs through that great city, burst its banks. So much so that it broke the wall down. All by, just by rain. And you have the Babylonians. And they said, well, that's great. We're going to have to lift the finger. And they started to advance. And then the whites got so scared and so panicky that they started to surrender. Even the king of Nineveh went to his castle, his palace. And he locked the doors and all of his wives and concubines and slaves. You know what he done? He had a funeral. And he burnt them all alive. He killed them all. That's how afraid he was of Babylonians. The rest of the Ninevites gave up and said, no, we surrender. The Babylonians didn't want to hear anything. You know what they done? They walked in and they destroyed everyone. They took no one as slaves. They killed every living soul. They burnt it to the ground. And there, none of it remains today. The ruins. There in Iraq you can visit the ruins of that great city. All because they did not turn to God. What a, what a difference the level would be today if they would just listen to Jonah and say, Hey, Jonah, we're going to stick with what you said. Today you can go there and this is all you'll see. The ruins of that once great city of Nineveh. Just like Nahum, we have a message of one of comfort and hope and encouragement to the body of Christ, the believers. We are here 
as a body to tell one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, say, listen, no matter what we're going through, we are not immune as Christians, we are not immune to the storms of life, but whatever we're going through, God is still loving, God is still good, and He's going to get you through it. But the other message we all have is a heavy message, a burdened one, one of judgment. Because if people outside this church that do not know Jesus, and their spiritual life is going to ruin us, and God has called each one of us, just like He's called another one, to go and preach to them that message of judgment. As much as we love the people out there, a lot of good people, they're sincere, they have families, they're good, generally good people. But you know what? If they don't know Jesus, they will end up in hell. Do you know that? Do you want your friends and family, your neighbors, to end up in that horrible place? Some people have this weird idea that hell is going to be a party. When I was growing up, I was very rebellious, believe it or not. Um, and you know, one of my friends were had this connotation that no, we don't worry, we're going to go to hell because it's going to be drinking and partying and booze and chilies. Woohoo! <laughs> oh boy, are they wrong? Have they never read anything in <coughs> the Bible? There's not one ancient writing that says that hell is a good place. It's a place of gnashing of teeth, of wailing and eternal torment in hell and fire and brimstone. It's a place where I don't want myself and my kids to go to. I don't want you guys to go there. I don't want anybody out of you to go to that place. We are burdened with this message of judgment as much as we love the people out there. We have to tell them the consequences of them rejecting God, of them rejecting Jesus. Their spiritual life will end up just like them in ruins, in a place called hell. When you leave this church, there's two principles you need to highlight in your, in your mind, and that is that God is love and God is good. Say it with me. God is love. God is good. All of us. God is good in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let us sing our last song called...